Hi guys, my name's Darren. Welcome, Maths Guru. Thank you very much for watching. I have a feeling this video is going to be a long one uh, because it's going to deal with so much of the course we've already done. It's part of the general maths course. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Life is good. Um, but, you know, uh, actually, while you've got your attention, can you just subscribe to my YouTube channel, please? Thank you very much. Just click that little button. It lets me know you're watching. Never going to be rich, never going to be famous. And also, if you can head to mathsguru.com, where there are downloadable notes and time codes and exam questions and uh, so, so much more, I'd be deeply grateful. Right, what are we looking at? Now, as I say, there's a lot to cover here. We're going to look at mean and median and how to compare, know when it's best to use the mean, when it's best to use the median. Understand what measures of spread are, i.e. the range of the interquartile range, and understand of standard deviation. Now, we have looked previously at something called a histogram. Yes, these are not the only way to represent, represent numerical data. Yes, in fact, when we drew this, as I said in previous lessons, you know, when we put this information in and we just did marks, what came up? It was, in fact, a dot plot. Now, we like dot plots because we keep our original data. By the time we start doing histograms and, and what have you, we start to lose our data. But there are other ways of showing numerical data, and that's what we're going to talk about today, or at least describing it. And the first one is mean. Now, I have to say, pentatonics, great, love them very much, um, and they do a phenomenal you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. If you actually don't know who pentatonics are, uh, load them up on YouTube. Really, really, really good. I wish I had as many subscribers as they did. Millions. All right. Now, basically, we've learned about the mean in previous years, in year seven, for example, and we know the mean is you add all the numbers together and you divide by how many numbers there are. And that's exactly what I've written here. The mean equals, now, because this is general maths and later on further maths, we need to know that we're going to try and trick you. And we say that the mean is given by the letter x bar. Right? So whenever you see that now, you can go, oh, it's the mean. But we also can write it in strange language. Uh, now, actually, this little e here means the sum. So when we read that EX, it means sum all the X values. Oh, hold on a moment. Interesting. And then we are going to divide by N the number of numbers or how many data items there are. Useful to know. So here is an example of our mean. So the following data set shows the number of primary ships run by each of the current AFL teams until the end of 2014. Find the mean of the number of premier ships won. How on earth would we do this? Well, basically the mean is going to be the sum of all my data items. Now there's only one set of numerical data there. We obviously can't add up the team names and find the average team name. That doesn't make any sense. That's categorical data. When it's got words in it, categorical. We can't find the average team name. What would that even mean? But we can find the average number of premierships one, because that's numerical data. So what I would now do is I would do 16 plus 16 plus 15 plus 12 plus 12 plus 11. And I'm going to keep going on until we get all the way down to zero and zero. And then I would divide that sum by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, 16, 17, 18, which I think is 18. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I divide that by 18. You're going to say, why did you count in German? I did two languages at school, French and German. That's about all I can do in either of those languages. <laughs> yes. In fact, I don't even think I can count 18 in French. But, so, putting all that in, I would then find out that my x bar would be equal to 118 divided by 18, which gives me 6.5555555555555 reoccurring. Now, in many cases, you're going to round this to a certain number of decimal points. I'm going to round this to two decimal places to say 6.5 and 6, and I'm going to put in brackets to 2dp just so the examiner knows I've rounded. All right, now obviously if I've done that incorrectly, please, please, please let me know because you never know, I may have made a mistake, but I'll leave that up to you to sort of let me know. But I think it's 6.56. How do you know how many decimal places to round to? Again, the exam will tell you. What about the median? Now whenever I go shopping, hope, thankfully for the moment, I am a medium in size, don't judge, yes? Which fascinates me because some people in previous schools have bought me large clothing. That makes me really, really depressed. Medium, occasionally a small, but mainly a medium. I just look bigger on camera, apparently, and in person. All right, 
So another measure we can use to describe is called the median, which is the number in the middle. Now, the problem with this is if I gave you the numbers 1, 7, 3, 2, 9, 6, 4, 8, 7, how many numbers have I got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 numbers. People will go, oh, 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 9 is the median. No, it isn't. Because to find the middle one, you've got to put them in order first. So you actually in this situation would go 1, 2, three, four, what have I got next? Six, seven, seven, eight, and nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine numbers. Now, do you notice I crossed them off? Why did I cross them off? So they didn't make a mistake. Data is there to trip you up. It, it makes, you make horrible, horrible mistakes. Now let's look at one in the middle. It's actually six. So my median for that data item would be six. Now, obviously, when you have odd numbers of data items, it's so easy to find the middle, all right? So if I have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and you're going to turn around and say, well, that was stupid, and I'm like, mm, hold on. There are named nine data items. How do you find the middle one? Lots and lots of different ways. One way of doing it is to say the number of data items plus 1 divided by 2. Now, that's not the median. That just tells you the position of the middle number. So there are 9 data items. Plus 1 divided by 2 is 10 divided by 2. It means the fifth number is my middle number. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That would be my middle number. Now, again, don't get tricked. Just because I've used the numbers 1 to 9, that's why 5 is there. It is the fifth number from either end, believe it or not. So if I did one, two, three, four, five, there's my middle number as well. I don't do it that way, believe it or not. I tend to cross numbers off. So I go one off the end, two off the end, one off the end, two off the end, one off the end, two off the end, one off the end, two off the end. And I keep doing that until I've only got one number left when there's an odd data item. So that's one way of doing it. What about if you have an even numbers of data items? So let's say we've got Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight data items there. So cross two off the end, two off the end, one off the end, one off the end. Uh oh, I'm not going to end up with one in the middle. I actually end up with two in the middle. And how do we find the middle? Well, we find the middle of those two data items. And when you want to find the middle of two numbers, you actually add them together and divide it by 2. Now you're going to turn and say, but hold on a moment, Muppet. It was easy, that was 8.5. Yes, it is 8.5 because I've chosen a pretty easy question. But what if you get numbers that aren't easy to find the middle? What if I told you the middle numbers were 16 and 934? You're going to take some time to try and work out the middle number is. But actually, the easy way of doing it is add those two numbers together and divide by two. That's the way you find the average of two numbers. So obviously in that situation, my answer would be 9.5. And so we would say the median of that data would be absolutely 9.5. Again, we could have used my position as n plus one divided by two. So how many data items do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we do eight plus one divided by two which is 9 divided by 2, which is 4.5. So what that means is it's halfway between, between the fourth and the fifth number. So 1, 2, 3, there's my fourth, and there's my fifth number. So we can use that as well. I, to be honest with you, I much prefer just the crossing off. Finding the position of the median, believe it or not, I've just actually said that. So the position of the median is given by the number of data items plus 1 divided by 2. And again, please, please, please don't get tricked. That is not the value of the median. That's just the position in the line when they're placed in order. And I say here very clearly, ordered list. All right, here's an example of finding the median. Right, let me see, what do we got here? We have got a stem and leaf diagram. Now, stem and leaf diagram, lovely, 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 find the median age of the 23 people. Let's use the formula. So the position is equal to the n plus one divided by two. How many data items are there? 23 plus 1 divided by 2, that's 24 data items, or 24 divided by 2, which gives me 12. Now again, 12 data items either from the front or from the end, but you've got to be careful with uh, stem and leaf diagrams. We count up this way, but we count backwards this way. Remember, when we're counting backwards, we have to start at either ends of my stem and leaf diagram. So if I do 12, 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Let's just check we do it the other way. 1, 2, 3, 4. Notice what I've done is I've got to the end of that line and I start again for 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and ka -ching. Alternatively, I could have just crossed them off either way. Now again, please, please, please don't get tricked with these things because that does not now mean my median is 1. You've got to be able to read these stem and leaf diagrams and it gives you a hint here that that one line two is equal to 12 years. So we've got a four as my stem, I've got a one as my leaf, so therefore the medium is equal to 41 years. ka -ching. Comparing the median and the mean. Now, in many cases, we use a calculator to do this, right? Because your calculator later on is going to show you all of the data items that you need. But what we can see is that the data gets skewed depending on the mean and the outliers. So for example, if I look at this data here, this would suggest that I've got some very, very big data items, but just a few of them. Now, big data items actually tend to make the mean very big, all right? So the bigger the data items, it makes the mean bigger and bigger. And if we have a small number of them, then it's gonna mess the mean up completely. Whereas in this situation, we would imagine the median would be somewhere around there, that middle data item. So to give you an actual example, if I have the numbers one, two, three, and four, and let's say five, at the moment, the mean and the median are both three. If you add those all together and work out the mean, and the medium is three, median. But if I now put 20 in here, what we notice is our median moves ever so slightly up. Not a lot, it now becomes 3.5. But if I work out the mean of that, in fact, let's just do that, let's turn my calculator on, let's do one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus 20. And we're going to divide that by one, two, three, four, five, six. We now notice our mean has gone from three and spiked to 5.8. That's massive. Yeah, so those big data items have made my mean much, much bigger. And it suddenly actually sort of give me a false picture of my data. Yes, likewise, if I have my data this way with lots of very small numbers and then big ones, what would we notice here? Well, my median would be there, but my mean would be much, much lower. So we have to be very, very careful about our mean and our median because when the data is roughly symmetrical, we can use either the mean or the median. Why? Well, because what I just said there was when it's symmetrical, the mean and the median are roughly around the same place. But when we have outliers or our data is skewed, we have to use the median. Don't use the mean. The range is a data item <coughs> or is... Um, is a statistics that we use, but again, with some sort of um, guidance. Now why, let's think about it. If I look at the range as being the highest number minus the smallest number, one, two, three, four, and five. Let's use those five data items. In this situation here, my range would be the highest data item minus the lowest data item, which is four. And okay, that's nice. We're saying the data is relatively compact, there's a difference of four between the data items. But what happens if I now do one, two, three, four, five, and let's say 20? My range now changes to 20 minus one, which is 19. I've added one extra data item, and my range now has blown out. And in many cases, it makes no sense whatsoever to use the range to describe data. It's okay for symmetrical data, but to be honest with you, we tend not to use it. We tend to use something called the interquartile range, which uh, is coming up in, in another video, all right? So we don't like the range. But let's have a look at here. Consider the marks for two different tasks awarded to a group of students. Task A and task B, find the range of each of these distributions. Distribution just says data sets. So the range of this one is, let's look for the lowest or the highest number. Oh, thankfully they put them in order for me, is 94. Take away two which gives me a range of 92. Now, assuming these were marks, that's a range of 92 marks. Let's look at the task B. The range is gonna be, if they put it in order again, they have 91 minus 11, which gives me 80. And so, there we go. We would now compare these data items. 
That's the whole point of doing this stuff, is to compare them. There's no point just saying, ah, oh, task A has a range of 92. Doesn't mean anything. Now we come to the interquartile range, I said a little about this, right? The range is subject to outliers. We don't like those big values. It doesn't make any sense to use them. So we tend to use something called the interquartile range. So if we look at the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, let's imagine these are my data items. Now we know that the median would fall there. So that's when we split our data into half. The median effectively splits our data into half. But what if we were going to split it into quarters? Well, in this situation, that is also really, really easy. Because when we have an even or this particular type of data set, we can split it into quarters really simply. So this is my medium. Now, this here is called my lower quartile. And this one here, funnily enough, is called my upper quartile because the data here are in my upper quartile and the data here are in my lower quartile. Or well, we've just split it into quartiles. Let's just leave it that way. So what do you reckon the interquartile range is? Well, if we think about the word range, it means the bigger one take away the smaller one. Inter means between, and quartile means quarters. So the between quarters, difference between the quarters, ah ha ha. So my interquartile range, which we use as IQR, is actually my upper quartile, minus my lower quartile. Now, what is the value of my upper quartile? Well, we know it falls halfway between six and seven. So in that situation, my upper quartile would be 6.5. Notice it's exactly the same working out, the same idea as the mean. Sorry, not the mean, the median. Where is my lower quartile? Well, it's halfway between two and three. So I'm now going to take away 2.5, which gives me a value of four. Now, the good thing about this is it's not massively affected by outliers. So if I put 30 on here, yes, my quartiles are going to move a little bit, but that actual value of 30 isn't really going to affect in a big way my middle 50% of the data. And you're going to say, hold on a moment, what do you mean 50% of the data? Think about it. This here is 25% of my data. This here is 25% of my data. That's 25% of my data. And that's 25% of my data. All right, so we've got eight data items, two in each. Each of those stands for 25%. And what we notice is that that means that this, these four numbers here are actually 50% of my data, or more importantly, the middle 50% of my data. Oh my goodness. So that's why we like this interquartile range, because it's just the middle 50% that we can compare for all data sets that doesn't really get affected by outliers or doesn't get affected too much. Right, so here's an example of the interquartile range. Find the IQR, yes, and uh, let's see. So it says compare, we'll do it first. So how many data items have we got here? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28. 30 data items. So we know that when we split this, if I do 30 plus 1 divided by 2, 31 on 2 is going to give me 15.5. So it's going to be somewhere between the 15th and the 16th data item. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh, well, that's good. So... Actually, why did I even do that? I was stupid. I already see, you see, which is halfway of my data item. So I know my median falls between 34 and 35, and my median there falls between 54 and 56. But again, that doesn't bother me. I'm not interested in that, because what I'm now going to do is half the data I've got left. So we're now going to split the data between 2 and 34 in half again. Because what's half of a half? A quarter. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 data items. So the position is going to be 15 plus 1 divided by 2. 15 plus 1 divided by 16. So it's the eighth data item. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that value there is actually my lowest quartile. The same is going to be true there because it's the eighth data item. And if you remember, eight data items from the front must mean that there are eight data items from the end as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there we go. That value there is my upper quartile. And that value there is my upper quartile. And I've done all the hard work.
So I now know my interquartile range is my upper quartile minus my lower quartile. My upper quartile in that situation was lovely. It sat right on 47 minus my lower quartile is 22. So 47 minus 22 gives me 25. So my middle 50% has 25 data items, 25 scores, 25 points, 25 people, who knows. This one here, my interquartile range is going to give me 73 minus 31, which gives me 42. ka uh, 73, I just want to make sure that's right. 73 minus 31 is 42. It is. All right, so there we go. Now, we've got to be able to compare them. And the word we use is, in fact, variability, right? So when we're talking about IQR, the interquartile round, we're saying there's less variability, yes? Because there's only 25 marks in task A for the middle 25% of people, uh, but there are 42 marks for task B for those middle 40s. So that means that the task B, they're spread out. They're quite spread out. But task A... They're much closer to together. There's only 25 marks between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. Yes, if we were to draw that as a diagram, this one here would be task B. And this one here would look like task A because the middle 50% is much, much closer together. So we would say task A marks is smaller. The variability, that's what I've said here, of task A marks is smaller than the variability of task B marks. And for those of you doing further maths next year, you're going to need to know that. Standard deviation is a really interesting statistic because it tells us how far the data is spread away from the mean value. It's just a number that's a bit funky to work out. And what we see here is here is my calculation. So to find this S, which stands for standard deviation, what do we do? We are going to do the square root of this E value. Do you remember what that E means? It's the sum. And it says the sum of x minus x bar squared. What on earth does that mean? Divided by n minus 1. Well, we end up with data. So when we do this, we have data. And we might have my data items as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We deconstruct this by sort of doing the formula in stages. So the first thing it says is do x minus x bar. Where have you seen x bar before? The mean. Congratulations. So what this says is, for each data item, take away the mean. So I would create a column with x minus x bar, and I would take away the mean. Well, the first thing I have to do is take all of these data, data items and work out what x bar is. And because I've chosen 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the x bar is 3. So I'm now going to take away 3 from each of my x values. That's what that says, remember, for the x minus x bar. So it become minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. All I've done is taken it away. What does my formula then tell me to do? Well, it puts it in brackets and it says, well, now square those values. So I'm now going to do x minus x bar squared, which gives me 4, 1, 0, 1, and 4. What does it then tell me to do? This e value, which means sum. So I'm now going to sum all those values together. So that's 4, 5, that would give me 10. I would then, what does it say? Divide that by n minus 1. So this value here is really important to me. I've got 10. So now I'm going to do 10, because that's what that is, divided by the number of data items minus 1, which would be 4. And then I would finish it off with my square root sign. And you would do that on your calculator, right? So this, this, and that would give me my standard deviation, this special measure of roughly speaking, how far away from my mean my data is actually spread. Yes? Now, long story short, where do we get this from? Well, if I look at a range of data items, and if you're watching this, you don't really need to. You can skip ahead to the next section of the video. This is more detailed than you probably need, but some people really like to know where the formula comes from. So what we do is if we have data items here, 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 and down here, for example, when we take the mean, we have some sort of central value. So that might be the mean of all of my data items, right? So when we add the physical crosses together and divide it by five in that situation, we'd end up with a mean value. Now, the reason we do this is because there's a statistical calculation that actually measures the distance of the mean from the data item. 
So in this situation here, that might have a distance of minus one. That might have a distance of one unit, yeah? Because the mean and the data item are, are one unit apart. So what we're really doing is those green lines are actually x minus x bar, right? So that could be, I don't know, minus a half, that could be a half, and that could be minus three. Now, obviously, in this situation, that's not going to work particularly well, but the problem is when we add all those values together, when we add all the, the differences together, those positives and negatives actually cancel out. They give us zero, which doesn't really help us with anything because we're trying to look for the average distance away from my mean. Now, what we can do is we actually do a bit of a fudge. We take all of these negative distances and we square them. So what we do is we take this cross and we actually flip it above. So that would have a distance of one. This cross here would have a distance of, believe it or not, a quarter. And this cross here would have a distance of nine. So we use a bit of a mathematical fudge to turn all those negatives into positive values. What do we then do? So that's why we've squared them. Then what do we do? Well, we sum the differences because we're trying to find the average difference. So if we add all those differences together, they don't become zero anymore. They'll actually become a value. So we found all of the distances. We found all of these distances. That's what that sum is. We're now going to divide it by the number of distances. Well, hold on. Do you see what I'm saying here? We've got the average distance now. We've added all the distances and we're dividing by, well, not n, we're doing n minus one. Now, depending on which country you're in, in the UK, I believe it's n. Here in Australia, it's n minus one. There's a big reason why. Don't worry about it, just do n minus one. So by doing that, we have the average distances, but sadly, what we've really got is the average square distances. And I suppose really that should also become a quarter because we square all the differences. We actually have the average square differences. Well, that's no use for me because I fudged my data to get it by squaring. So what I then have to do is once I've got that, I have to square root it to get it back into the units we are. So for example, if my data, if these, these data items were in centimeters, by squaring it, I'd have actually had centimeters squared. So I'd have to square root it again. Now again, that will just give you an idea of why the standard deviation formula is what it is and how we calculate it. We obviously want to use it to come up with the data items two, three, and four. So again, this is just another example and you will notice we've got a number of tables. The first one is X because when we look at the dart, when we look at the formula, the first thing says take each of the data items, which is two, three, and four and subtract the mean. Again, because I've chosen an, e an easy set of data, the mean is three. You probably would have to work it out. So I'm now going to do x minus x bar, which is three. So it becomes minus one, zero, and one. What does my formula tell me to do then? Well, I've done the x minus x bar. That's in brackets, and I've got to square it. So I'm now going to do x minus x bar squared, which gives me one, zero, and one. What does my formula then tell as I continue to build it up? sum those values together, which gives me two. What do I then do? I divide that by the number of data items less one. So I'm now going to say that my standard deviation is two divided by two, because there are three data items. Take away one is two, and then I'm going to square root it. Well, that gives me the square root of one, which is one. So I now have this standard deviation as one. That means that on average, my data is sort of uh, distributed either side of the mean by one unit. And that sort of makes sense if you think about it, yeah? Now, the good news is your calculator does all this for you. So if you're using the TI Inspire, this is for you. Here's my data item. I've got month and rainfall. Now, obviously, in this situation here, because I'm doing just one set of data, all right, univariate data, I don't I'm not interested in the month. I don't need to put the month into my calculator in any way, shape, or form. I'm just looking at the data item. So I'm opening a list of spreadsheet. I must, must, must make sure that I put the title heading in first. And because we're dealing with rainfall, I chose rain, and then I put the data items in. You can see 48, 57, 52, 57. When you put the data items in, please be very careful and make sure you put them in in order and check that you've done it properly. Having done that, 
You don't need to change screens. What you can then do is go menu, statistics, statistic calculations. And you'll notice that up comes a load of stuff, one variable statistics, two variable statistics. Because we're only dealing with one variable, again, I'm not interested in the month because I'm just dealing with one variable, which is the rainfall, and I've only got one column in my data, I'm going to do one variable statistic, right? Now, for some stupid reason, it then says, well, how many lists have you got? Well, one, believe it or not. I don't know whether it will do more than one, but let's just say one. So we said one, and then it comes up with another dialog box, and it says, well, what's your X list? Now don't choose the default there. I didn't say B with the square brackets. I clicked on the down arrow and then I said rain. That's why we title these things so we don't get confused later on when it gets a bit more interesting. So we chose rain, I left all the rest of the stuff as is. Okay, and what comes up? Well, you've noticed that what you get now is something, it's two columns. One that says title, and then one with all these strange things. We've got x bar, we've got e of x, we've got e of x squared. Now they, we're not interested in that, we're not interested in that. The good news is that, you know, we now know what x bar stands for. The one we're really looking for is the one that has s, x, right? So s, x is your standard deviation. If you're using the Casio class pad, I think you come up with an actual table. It gives you a dialog box with all the information in it. But the point of it is you're looking for SX when this situation would be 5.81, yes? It also says determine the mean and the standard deviation, the median and the interquartile range. Well, again, all of that information is actually given in this table. If we scroll down, as I'm saying here, so as I've scrolled down, what do I notice? I've got min X, I've got Q1X, I've got the median, I've got Q3X. Now, to us explain that, the lower quartile is actually called Q1, the upper quartile is called Q3, and obviously we've got the median. So if we're trying to find the interquartile range, I'd be able to do that because I'd now say the interquartile range is my Q3, which is 59, minus my Q1, which is 49.5, which gives me something like, let's do that because I don't want to make a silly mistake. He says, turning on his calculator, 59 minus 49.5 gives me 9.5. That's what I was going to say, believe it or not, but I'm tired of re-recording videos because I've done something wrong. 9.5 is my interquartile range. So we've got that. What about my range? How can I find my range? Well, I'd be looking for my min x. Now again, notice the min x and my max x uh, could also be found in this. Yes, yeah, so I could use that to find my range. The median they've given me, the median here is 57 and the standard deviation we've worked out from a previous screen and the mean, again, going back to my previous screen, remember the mean is this X bar and it's there. So this is awesome just by putting that into my calculator and doing that sort of menu, what was it? Menu, um, stats, stat calculations and one variable statistic gave me all the information I needed. Now you're gonna say, why on earth would I use this? Trust me, later on you're going to. Now I know this has been a really long video. Thank you for watching if you're still watching. Probably not, but it's been really good to see you. My name is Darren MathsGuru. Subscribe if you can, mathsguru.com, sign up and let your mates know. Otherwise, hopefully, I'll see you in another video. You take care of yourselves, guys. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Yes, this is the end of another video. If you haven't already done so, can you click on my subscribe button? Yes, it doesn't mean anything other than the fact that I know that you are watching. Yes, it's greatly appreciated. Otherwise, I feel like I'm sitting here just talking to myself. And then, yes, there is mathsguru.com, of which you can see a still of now. And what is over there? Well, all the videos ordered by textbook, ordered by topic. You can search for the videos. You can download notes time codes, exam questions, and so, so much more coming up. Yeah, it's absolutely free to join. So I'm done. Thank you very much. I hope to see you in another video. Give me a shout out to your mates if you can. I just want to make sure that everyone finds maths interesting and easy. All right, take care, guys. See you again. Bye-bye. Stay safe.